We compare Star Wars factions from Legends and Canon to figure out which one has the worst leader. All that and more on today's Star Wars Factions Compared. Hey guys, this is Zach Hartzlotter. Hello and welcome to another episode of Factions Compared, the series where I take four different Star Wars factions and compare them in some meaningful way. On that note, do you have an idea for a future Factions Compared episode? Make sure to leave it down in the comments, and if you see an idea you like, also give it a thumbs up alongside this video. So today we'll be looking at which Star Wars faction had the worst leader, and I thought it'd be fun if we avoided some of the major ones that I've spent a lot of time talking about, including the Empire, the Rebel Alliance, the Confederacy and the Republic, and instead focused on some different factions. So today we'll be looking at Natasi Dalla of the Galactic Alliance, Borsk Felia of the New Republic, Supreme Leader Snoke of the First Order, and finally, Admiral Galad Pelion of the Imperial Remnant. And one thing we're going to struggle with this video is trying to connect a leader's actual leadership of their faction with their overall successes and failures. I'm going to try to take it all holistically, but that is something I will talk about throughout the comparison and the way we'll do this as always is I'll give a brief profile of the four characters and then at the end I will rank them from worst to best. With that being said let's get started with one of the strangest leaders in Star Wars Admiral Natasi Dalla. So Admiral Natasi Dalla started her military career under the Empire before eventually serving as the Chief of State of the Galactic Alliance which was the successor state to the New Republic. Dalla was a supposed supposedly skilled tactician, although to be honest I haven't seen much evidence of that, and as such she fell under the gaze of Grand Moff Tarkin. Tarkin helped continue her training, and eventually she was moved to the Maw installation where she sat in isolation throughout the Galactic Civil War and beyond. Eventually, after the Battle of Endor, she discovered that the Empire had largely been dismantled, the Emperor killed, and she emerged from the Maw installation with four Star Destroyers and some highly experimental technology. This was largely a failure. Under her watch, she lost control of the Sun Crusher. All but one of her Star Destroyers would be annihilated. She would only secure a few minor victories against under-defended rebel worlds, and eventually she would be forced to retreat. Dala would emerge again through the Imperial Remnant, where she actually had some success unifying the Imperial Warlords and creating a single Remnant fleet, complete with a Super Star Destroyer and many Star Destroyers and smaller ships and this was probably her greatest success of this era, unifying all of these smaller Imperial Splinter factions. However, Dala was almost immediately defeated in dramatic fashion at the Battle of Yavin, and she left in disgrace. Dala would remain a relatively minor figure until after the Yuzhan Vong War, where somehow she would move her way into the position of Chief of State of the Galactic Alliance, largely because of her intervening during the Second Galactic Civil War and the fact that she was seen by some, like Luke Skywalker, as a somewhat neutral figure. Very strange. In my opinion, Dala did not adapt well to a post-Second Galactic Civil War society. First of all, she heavily targeted the Jedi, blaming them for Jason since fall, exiling Luke from Coruscant and the Jedi Order, and eventually starting a war and a purge against the Jedi themselves. This saw the galaxy nearly tore apart, it allowed malicious actors like Abeloth to secure power on Coruscant and throughout the galaxy, and by the end of her reign, Dala had became a very Palpatinian figure. She ended up falling to a Jedi coup, but was also targets of Imperials throughout the galaxy, and really did nothing but create a lot of chaos by antagonizing the Jedi in a period that should have been one of peace. Her reign as Chief of State would last less than three years. But let's move on, and we have today arguably one of the most admirable Imperials of all time, that is Grand Admiral Pelion, Supreme Commander Pelion, Admiral Pelion. He's had many, many ranks. For the purposes of today's video, Pelion's leadership begins at the Battle of Endor, where he failed to unite a fleeing Imperial force, which ended up scattering across the galaxy. However, most prominently in his early years, he served as second in command. I say early, he was still quite old at this point. Second Second in command to Grand Admiral Thrawn. When Thrawn died, he was unable to unite Thrawn's forces at Bilbringi, another failure akin to Endor, and really he would serve in advisory or secondary roles until Natasi Dalla and the Battle of Yavin. At Yavin, when Natasi Dalla lost the Nighthammer, command of the Imperial Remnant was transferred to Galad Pelion, and he was actually relatively successful in this era. 
Pelion was very pragmatic, especially when compared with other Imperial hardliners. His goal was to ensure the survival of the Empire and their ideals in some form, and was willing to see the Empire change form to continue. Pelion moved out of the Deep Core, which the Empire had been holding up until that point, moved to the Outer Rim, unified more Imperial warlords, and created a stable but severely weakened Imperial Remnant faction. Pelion and the Imperial Remnant would be hunted down by the New Republic, they would lose some of the remaining Super Star Destroyers, Pelion was grappling with a difficult Moff Council, but eventually secured a peace with the New Republic with the signing of the Pelion Gavrisim Accords. Pelion, as I said, was very pragmatic. He helped the Imperial Remnant survive when, practically, they did not have the power to openly contest the New Republic, certainly not when fractured. The Imperial Remnant would survive throughout the Yuuzhan Vong War and beyond. Pelion would lead them in allying and partnering with the Galactic Alliance before his eventual assassination at the Battle of Fondor. Alright, next up we have one of the most hated characters in Star Wars, Borsk Felia. And I say hated because that's relevant to this discussion. Borsk Felia was hated because, to readers, he is often seen as power-hungry, easily manipulated, and purely self-interested, which is a common trait among Bothans. Borsk Felia was a prominent member of the New Republic's Council, pretty much at its formation. He often butted heads with other council members, including especially Admiral Akbar. Philia, perhaps more than any single individual, was heavily manipulated by Grand Admiral Thrawn, who saw an opportunity to take Akbar out of active service, playing on Philia's greed and single-minded nature. Philia would seriously hamper the war effort and would even threaten the life of a very pregnant Princess Leia, exposing his true nature through a covert recording. Philia would regain influence in the New Republic and, after the tenure of Princess Leia, would become Chief of State of the entire government. Philia's greatest failings, however, would come in the early years of the Yuuzhan Vong War. Despite pleas from the Jedi, especially Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia, Philia refused to recognize the Yuuzhan Vong as even existing existing, much less a threat, and alongside his sycophants, he refused to send reinforcements to the Outer Rim. This allowed the Vong to gain a foothold in the galaxy, and of course, the rest is a very bloody history. Like Dala, Felia also had a hate for the Jedi, which played very well for the Yuuzhan Vong, who rightfully saw the Jedi as their greatest threat to domination. Felia, however, would somewhat redeem himself at the end of his life, throwing support behind the Jedi and Leia, and at the invasion of Coruscant, detonating a suicide bomb which would kill over 25,000 Yuuzhan Vong warriors. Still, his legacy would not be all positive, as his council of sycophants would remain an impediment to New Republic security after his death. Alright, finally we have Supreme Leader Snoke, and this is a sort of weird one because Snoke was obviously engineered by Palpatine. We don't know the degree to which he was directly controlled. Still, we'll assume that most of what Snoke did, he did for his own reasons and with his own thought. And Supreme Leader Snoke was actually fairly successful. Say what you will about the First Order, Supreme Leader Snoke's formation and guardianship of the burgeoning new Imperial faction was almost genius. Snoke took advantage, or the First Order did generally, of pre-existing fissures within the New Republic. Not only were resources covertly funneled away from the New Republic, but agents within the government helped to sow discord and confusion, and also ensured that by the time the First Order did emerge, the New Republic was very, very weak. Snoke did all this while also converting Kylo Ren and creating a massive base of operations in the Unknown region. Now, it's true that Snoke did inherit Imperial technology like Starkiller Base, but still, he attacked the New Republic with a vast, dominating armada, including the one-two punch of Starkiller Base and the almost unstoppable fleets that he commanded. By the Starkiller Base incident alone, the First Order really had no opposition. Not only was New Republic leadership destroyed, but also much of their fleet. And by the time of his death, the First Order was extremely well positioned to succeed. And we see in between Episode 8 and Episode 9 in supplementary material that the First Order is continuing their domination of the galaxy. And there's really no reason except for some heroics by the good guys that they could have ever been opposed. The First Order did a great job of making making sure that local systems couldn't stand up to them, they punished single systems individually and with no central fleet, they were destined for domination. 
Snoke's biggest mistake was misunderstanding his student, Ben Solo, also known as Kylo Ren. And while that's not a mistake that you can wave away, it's a very standard bad guy misunderstanding the situation type of mistake. With that being said, let's rank our commanders and we'll go from fourth to first. But remember, we're looking at worst here. So fourth is actually the best of the four. And with that position, we have Gulad Pelion. Pelion managed to take an empire which was fractured beyond belief, a very difficult starting position, and brought it to a point where it would survive for the next hundred years in some form, when it looked like they were near the edge of collapse. Pelion was shrewd, he was pragmatic, and by the end of things, he was, to be fair, hardly imperial. He was someone that, in Star Wars Legends, the good guys get along with. He has the ability to realize that the empire he thought he served never really exist, and instead moved to ensure that the principles of justice and security, which he believed the empire was founded on, could still survive in some form. At number three, the third worst, or the second best leader, we have Snoke. Now, Snoke didn't really do anything wrong. He smashed the New Republic in a week. The thing is, his starting position also wasn't very difficult, which is why I give Pelion a bit more credit. You can debate who's best and who's second best down in the comments, but let's move on. At number two, I have Natasi Dala. And I'm just going to talk about Dala and Phalia together, because well, there's only two left, we might as well. Natasi Dala was probably dumber than Borsk Phalia in a lot of ways. She makes so many mistakes from the time she's introduced in the Jedi Academy trilogy. She loses the Sun Crusher, her three Star Destroyers, experimental technology, the Maw installation. She goes on and destabilizes the Galactic Alliance, almost starts another war. But despite the fact that she makes all these mistakes, if you look at results, it's hard to say that her actions led to worse consequences than that of Borsk Phalia. Borsk Phalia was incredibly single-minded, he cared only about himself, and because of that, and because he wasn't willing to look at the Yuzhan Vong invasion in a realistic way, the Vong were able to get their foothold in the galaxy, and would go on to kill trillions. Had the New Republic responded properly to the Yuzhan Vong at Vector Prime, and in those subsequent weeks, there's no way the Vong could have succeeded. The Yuzhan Vong took advantage of the poor governance of the New Republic, the fact that so many worlds and civilians and shipping lanes were undefended, and slowly snaked their way towards Coruscant. A single, unified response could have ended this much, much sooner. That's my ranking though, so at very worst, we have Borsk Phalia, then we have Natasi Dala, followed by Supreme Leader Snoke, and finally Galad Pelion at fourth worst or the best. But that's just my opinion. Let me know your thoughts down below. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. Let me know you'd like to see next time. Until then though guys, this has been Eckhart's Letter. Be safe, have a good one, and may the Force be with you.